Hello, good evening and welcome to News at 10. We're coming to you live from the News Hub at Adesawe, Kandai and Accra. We're live on 3FM 92.7 as well as on your DSTV channel 279. Over the next 30 minutes, we'll bring you news from across the country and beyond. But first, let's take a look at today's major news highlights. The Takradi Circuit Court, presided over by Justice Rita Doku, has remanded two persons in prison custody for attempting to traffic 47 people to Conakry, Guinea. The two were also charged with preparing to operate a small-scale mining business without license. Vice President Dr. Mahamadou Baumia has inaugurated a total of 23 housing blocks containing 368 housing units for the Ghana Navy at Tema New Town. The 156 million Ghana City Naval Barracks is the first major accommodation for the service. And some workers of Goldfields Ghana Limited Takwa clashed with security forces Monday morning as they embarked on a demonstration. Seven workers were arrested. And the Bank of Ghana has dragged the directors of 30 microfinance companies to the Economic and Organized Crime Office for investigations and prosecution for alleged embezzlement and fraud. But banking consultant Dr. Richmond Etiahini says this is not enough and wants strict enforcement of banking regulations, especially corporate governance of financial institutions. Those are our main news highlights. We're streaming live on our Facebook page and on streamnews.com. You can also watch us on your DSTV channel 279 and you can hear us live on 3FM 92.7. Up next is the big one. Welcome. Now, traders occupying areas next to the Nima residents of President Tukufuado say they're ready to vacate the area by the deadline. The traders' alleged custodians of the land have accused a private developer of conniving with officials from the Flagstaff House to take the land. Traders occupying the land engage in different activities to earn a living. These include carpentry, auto mechanics, hairdressing, man and chop bar, among others. Some claim they have occupied the land for three decades, which they pay tenant fees to the landowner. However, national security officials last month asked all the traders to vacate the area by March 15 due to security threats their existence in the area could pose to the president. They have been compensated, but the traders accused their leaders of shortchanging them. The news team were told each occupant received 10,000 cities, but they received between 1,000 and 6,000 cities, whilst others received nothing. <laughs> That's all. Others don't want their compensation packages made public. The leadership, however, declined to comment on the matter. When a news team visited the area Monday morning, some traders were preparing to leave. But just as the news team was preparing to leave the scene, a middle-aged woman approached the team and showed us a document about the land in question. Site plan, any? She explained the land belongs to her late grandmother who leased it out to a real estate developer 19 years ago over a 50-year period. She accused the developer of conniving with officials from Flagstaff House to forcibly take over the land without informing the Alodia owners. 19 years ago, she 
She said although the family supports the eviction of the occupants, they must have knowledge of any deal between the developer and Flagstavas over the land. The area is likely to face mass demolition after the Thursday, March 15 deadline elapsed. Meanwhile, the director for the Center for European Studies, Professor Ransford Jampo, has told the president to relocate to the Flagstaff House and stop inconveniencing traders around his private residence. The professor of political science expressed his appointment that the presidential residence has become a waste. Uh, he's joining us on the telephone lines now. Prof, uh, good evening and thank you extremely. So you are of the view that the Flagstaff House is wasting away? Hello, sir. Um, yes, um, yes sir. good evening to your viewers. I think um, I, was, I was just watching and listening to what you were saying in your reportage, and you suggesting that um, the national security officials who are advising that the traders around the president's uh, leave, uh, working around the president's you know, house should leave because he posed a security threat to the president. And I, I am disappointed in that kind of advice to the president. It's a bogus national security advice to the president. Why can't they advise the president to move to the well-secured and strategically built and located presidential mansion in the Flagstaff House? It is the duty of every sovereign state to house its president. And all over the world, presidents have mansions and places where they live. And after elections, they move in there with pride. Such mansions are usually well designed and located in a manner that assures the security of the president and minimizes needless inconveniences to road users that may be occasioned by mm. frequent commuting by the president from his personal residence to the office, um, official residence. And so the presidential mansion itself um, also contributes to our nationhood and national pride. So that's why visitors, when they visit, and tourists, when they come, you are proud to show them that this is where our president lives. You don't show um, the pri private residence of a president to visitors when they visit. It was for good reason, in my view, that the Flagstaff House was built. It's expected to house the president and also serve as his office. In this regard, it is fitted with all gadgets and infrastructure necessary for peaceful um, and secured accommodation and then also work. Now, since it was built, leaders have refused to put it to its full use. This is typical, in my view, of our disingenuous mentality that runs down state property and encourages much wastage and dissipation of state resources. I, I don't know what is, what is wrong with us, but living in one's own house as president may be costly to the state, particularly when the resident, the private resident, wasn't built to house presidents. It means we have to duplicate the already existing security arrangements at the Flagstaff House in the private residence of the president. Now, why this waste? The president was part of the government that decided to build this national monument. I'm talking about the presidential mansion in the Flagstaff House. So why wouldn't he put it to use? Right. Why should it be run down? Jay Kufour lived in his house, but he had a solid reason that the castle, given its negative historical antecedent, could never be a seat of government. Right, and he uh, saw the danger posed to his life in the accident he encountered um, at Opeb when he was commuting from his house to the workplace. And so commuting from your own house and, and all that, it's not only about the people selling or traders around your private residence, but also commuting from your own house to the office every now and then is a security threat to other road users, and then it endangers the life of the president. Himself. Right, uh, Prof. You know the, 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 the sirens that are blown, and then the way sometimes the, the drivers drive recklessly 
trying to drive on the shoulders of the road because sirens are being blown and all that. Sometimes right. it endangers pedestrians, it endangers drivers, and then it endangers the president himself. Right. Uh, Prof, well, we're grateful for your time. Uh, Professor Ransford Jampo is with the uh, University of Ghana and uh, in, uh, still related to this, a security analyst uh, with the uh, Jetty K Center for Human Security and Peace Building, Adib Sani, has stated that the seat of government, Flagstaff House, is not any uh, safer place uh, that guarantees the safety of the President of the Republic of Ghana than his NEMA residence. The analyst is recommending the use of the Pediasi Lodge instead to keep the president safe at all times. Uh, he is of the view that the security of the president goes beyond Donado himself and it's about protecting and defending the security and sovereignty of our nation. Uh, Mr. Sani Adib is joining us in the studio uh, tonight for a discussion on this. Uh, so, Mr. Adib, I, I'm curious. Uh, you heard Professor Jampo saying that it's high time, uh, basically, for the president to go and uh, reside at the Flagstaff House and utilize the facility which was put up by uh, by the state for the, the president, like you said that the presidency goes beyond the person, Nana Kufuado. Uh, so what makes you now think that uh, Pediasa Lodge is much safer than uh, the, the Flagstaff House? Well, thank you very much. A very good evening to your viewers. Um, first of all, let me state emphatically that um, there's absolutely no way the eviction of the squatters uh, around the, uh, uh, the the residence of the president will provide, will better, provide security. better security for the president. And when you juxtapose it against the Flagstaff House, it is not any better. Indeed, in Why security, is it not any better in terms of location or exactly. what? Proximity I to have, the I, French Embassy or what? I exactly? have personally from the exterior because I have not had the opportunity to go into mm. the Flagstaff House or the President's residence to conduct any research. But from the exterior, a risk analysis. Uh, uh, of, of, of the Flagstaff House, I mean, shows some level of gaff or some level of security nightmare because this is the case. We have a presidential palace um, where we have heavy vehicular and human traffic all around it, right from when you're coming from the vice president's house all the way around TV3 to the liberation road. There's so much vehicular traffic, but under normal and circumstances, there's Kanda right there, there at the uh, presidential drive. Exactly. Under normal circumstances, um, in security studies, we have something called a security bubble under which the president is supposed to live. And within that bubble, we have a number of perimeters. Okay, We have the first, the second, and the third perimeter, usually made up of the police and military at the outer perimeter, the inner per perimeter, we have the secret service in Ghana, we call them national security mm. operatives. Then in the very inner, we have the main presidential protective So, so basically what you're saying is that of all the analysis that go into this, uh, there is indication that the flags of ours is not safe. It's absolutely not safe because it is best Just international. Just as unsafe as his private Exactly, residence. because it is best international practice that the, gov the, the president, his living area or his bedroom, so to speak, should be some level of distance from a bustling uh, 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 setting, okay? So to the east, to the west, to the north, to the south, at least there should be some level of distance, preferably about 300 meters. But mm. we have heavy vehicular traffic just 20 feet away from the walls of the presidential villa. It doesn't make it safe enough. Come to think of it, it is uncomfortably close to the French embassy and other private and corporate properties all around. And these days, people sit in the comfort of their homes and they are able to snoop, they are able to pry on sensitive information. And we're dealing with the presidency of the country. So for me, in the first place, the location of the Flagstaff House is a security nightmare for us. We're dealing with an era of terrorism and you, God forbid, and now you know mm. the strategy they use with car bombing, so, especially so, so, the Sadi, uh, so, so what makes uh, Pediasi much better? Um, considering the location. Because there is, there is also mm. vehicular traffic uh, along uh, but it's not, it's not as Pediasi bustling. is in the town of Ibri, Ayman uh, is close by. No doubt about that, but it's not as bustling or as densely populated as we have uh, with the Flagstaff House. Come to even think of it in defense 
studies. I mean, you study about mm. how to defend yourself, security, and other things, etc. The topography of the land, the terrain, the hilly nature of it is an added security advantage to whoever would be protecting it. Come to even think of it, indeed, we I agree, hook, line, and sink, that we have a main road just uh, 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 in front of the mm. Pedrasi Lodge. We can we can up the security protocols and measures there to right. ensure some level of safety. That would include the erection of some barricades and some roadblocks right. and um, possibly do some searches. But Zadib, let's move away from uh, the security of, of the president to so the general security. Uh, the police is saying that they have uh, arrested five robbery Kimpings, uh, that's the expression they use, within six days of intensifying Operation Calm Life. Uh, do you feel this is an indication that we're winning the fight against armed robbery or is too early? Um, it is too early to say, but um, this is, of course, one of the means we will be winning the fight against uh, robbery. Like I indicated, the issues with the police is multifaceted, it's multi thronged and um, a whole lot would have to be done apart from the investigation regime, which has to be effective and efficient the response time would also have to be closed up a bit and most importantly the provision of logistics but this news is coming to me as um, um, uh, as, as a very uh, uh, good thing because it seeks to send a clear message to these criminals that gone are the days where you would perpetrate such crimes and get away with it because we keep asking ourselves what is emboldening these criminals what is giving them that um, motivation to be able to even carry out their crime in broad daylight most of it is as a result of the fact that many of these crimes go unpunished because we don't have a, an effective investigation regime. So the fact that these guys have been arrested is a clear indication of uh, 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 the commitment of the police into ensuring that we're safe. But I hope it doesn't end there. Mm. Okay? But the IGP, usually the IGP adds a catch to it. He says that uh, a major part of the work has been done and the uh, rest of the uh, suspects involved in various crimes recorded in the city over the past week will soon be arrested. I mean, I know that it sounds too good to be true, but you believe exactly that a major part of the work has been done? No, I, d I don't believe a major part of it, but at least um, significantly um, a part of the work has been done. Uh, and like I indicated, there's still a lot more they mm. can do. Uh, this statement might just be political on the face of it, but um, there's no room for complacency. Um, much more security would have, uh, we would have to give more uh, credence to police security apart from the fact that uh, some credence would also have to be given right. to border security and defense as well. Right. But there's no room for complacency. Right, uh, Ms. Adib, I'm grateful for your time. Sunny Adib is uh, the executive director of the JTK Center for Human Security. And uh, I'm Stephen Enti. This is still News at 10. You are watching us live on TV3 and hearing us on 3FM 92.7. You can also see us on uh, your DSTV channel 279. We'll, we'll be right back with more news. Welcome back. Now, TV3 can confirm that the Tema Regional Police Commander has invited the Managing Director of the Bulk Oil Storage and Transportation Bost, Alfred Obing Boating, over alleged death threats on the life of Executive Secretary of the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers, Duncan Amor. The Alfred Obing is expected to report on Tuesday, March 13. The threats of death were after investigations by COPEC into the sale of some 1.8 million barrels of crude oil by Bost, causing the state to lose about $5.3 million. Duncan Amor on Sunday raised the alarm that his life was in danger after he uncovered an alleged shady deal at Bost. Meanwhile, uh, Bost has rubbished the claims by Duncan Amor in that expose. Now let's go to Sierra Leone now, where presidential election results were too close to call with the two front runners, neck and neck, making a second round likely. So uh, what's the latest in that country? Now uh, let's get onto the telephones and uh, speak with Phoebe and Swill, who is a journalist in Sierra Leone, joining us now. Uh, thanks very much, Phoebe, and, uh, for your time. So what's the latest in Sierra Leone? 
Well, this evening people are expecting the National Electoral Commission to announce the remaining 25% of the results, which would mean an official declaration of the winner of the election. But unfortunately, the announcement was not made. Instead, a press release was um, issued, and hopefully they would announce the result in the coming days. They stated in the release that they're still recounting. So adding to the 81, 83 centers we had that they were counting, they've added... There's an addition of about 61 more stations added to the previous number. So that's a total of about 114 to 115 more polling stations going through a recount. That's just to um, satisfy the concerns of the opposition and other political parties raising the issue of some miscount going on in some of these polling stations. Mm. So, in terms of actual numbers, what does it look now? Uh, because yesterday when we spoke, it did appear that the opposition SLPP uh, were in a, in a lead uh, with about 25% mm -hmm. more of the votes yet to mm -hmm. come in. So, in terms of what have come in so far, how does both sides, how does it look like for both sides in terms of percentages? In terms of the same page, it's the same thing. The SLPP is leading by 14,919 votes. More counting has not been announced by the Electoral Commission, so the figures stand at the same as they were yesterday when they announced the additional 25, making it 75% of the vote. And so the likelihood of a runoff still stands because the 55% that any political party should individually score Right. Uh, I think we lost uh, Phoebe and on the telephone lines now. Uh, we'll try and reconnect uh, with her and get a final wrap of the situation in uh, Sierra Leone. But uh, let's come back uh, to Ghana here, where an across circuit court judge, uh, Justice Abwaji Tando, has expressed displeasure over the delay of the case involving some 12 individuals accused of escaping from lawful custody from the Kwabenya uh, police station in Accra. Justice Stando cautioned that he will not countenance any further delays after the prosecutor, Chief Superintendent Kweku Bimpa, told the court investigations was ongoing after several attempts to commence trial. Here's a report by my colleague Godfrey Tanam. The accused person sat in the courtroom expecting the prosecution to announce it was ready to commence trial. To their disappointment, the prosecutor, Chief Superintendent Kweku Bempa, told the court he had not completed investigations and will need more time to finish the court with progress of work. This did not go down well with the accused persons whose disappointment was clearly evident in their faces. The presiding judge, Abwaje Tando, did not take this kindly. He gave the prosecutor, Superintendent Bempa, a strong rebuke. He asked him to stop putting up excuses, who he said was delaying the trial. Abwaje Tando had earlier said March 9, 12, 14 and 15 to fast track the trial. It will be recalled that seven suspected criminals escaped from lawful custody from the Kwabinya police station on January 21. The seven were assisted by a group to escape from police custody. The attack led to the death of one police officer at the station. Two others involved in the cell break, Prince Ose and Atakujo, are already serving 30 months imprisonment each. On students of Academy of Christ the King Senior High School in Cape Coast have demonstrated against encroachment of their school land by members of the Abra community in Cape Coast. The demonstration follows alleged threats on their colleagues by the encroachers who at times wield offensive weapons like guns and knives. Our Central Regional Correspondent Thomas Vincent Kahn witnessed the demonstration and has filed this report. It's about 8.30 Monday morning and students should have been in class for the first lesson. The demonstrating students moved around the boundaries of the school where encroachers have taken over to register their displeasure. Police personnel from the regional command later arrived at the school to provide security. The students narrated instances where some encroachers threatened to kill a student if the school authorities did not allow them to execute their project. People come for prep and instead of them to have peace of mind and study, they are being threatened and they are no more 
having that comfort to study. So looking upon the things that are happening on campus, we the students, we know that this is the property that we've got. And this is where that we have to study. And learning without a peaceful environment, there is no way we are going to make it. Headmistress of the school, Florence Offair, said the school is unsafe and not conducive for academic work to continue and has called for immediate intervention by stakeholders. Uh, anytime we go on the land issues, these same people come to threaten the students and me, the headmistress. They would threaten me. They threatened one student when they came for night studies. And he had a knife, according to the students. I told him, catch our headmistress in. If she wants to deal with the land issue, start killing the students. When she sees that we are killing the students, then she'll stop what she's doing. The Academy of Christ the King Senior High School, which is virtually being turned into a boarding school, lacks infrastructural facilities, including a dining hall, assembly hall, and classrooms. According to the school authorities, about 74 plus of land earmarked for the school has been encroached upon and reduced to 20. And that's our wrap up with News at 10. Thank you very much uh, for making time. And we have the crew here. Good night and thanks for staying.